good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're from. Um, and thank you for tuning in. It's a pleasure to be able to present to you my session on introduction to Power Automate Desktop um, at the New Zealand Business Application Summit uh, 2022. So my name is Eric Chang. I'm a digital solutions architect with Komatsu Australia. I've been architecting and developing solutions for over 15 years across Office 365, business applications and Azure. Certified Azure Architect, DevOps Engineer, Power Platform Maker, and Trainer. Please feel free to reach out to me on social media, send me an email, or find me on a Power Users community forums where I enjoy helping the community learn more about the Power Platform. So I'd just like to provide a bit of an overview of what you would expect to get out of today's session. And the idea here is not really to make you an expert in Power Automate desktop in an hour, but, also, but more so to provide you with an introduction of the fundamentals, give you the knowledge so that you can go know enough and continue your journey after the end of this session and continue learning on your own. So firstly, I'll talk a little bit about what RPA is because that's what Power Automate Desktop is. We'll talk about you know, how the technology has been around for a little while now, so a bit more than a decade, but it's still gaining in popularity. So why is that? What is the value proposition of RPA as a technology within an organization and why you should learn and um, why you should learn this technology? We'll then talk about how RPA fits in within the Power Platform. Now we'll explore what a Power uh, a desktop flow is, right? The type of desktop flows that you can expect to create and also the difference between a cloud flow and a desktop flow because it's actually a question I still get and hear a lot about. We'll then talk about the prerequisites um, you'll need to set up in order to get started with Power Automate Desktop. We'll touch on licensing a little bit, and then we'll jump straight into demos. We'll install Power Automate Desktop onto this machine. We'll go through a few examples um, of uh, creating desktop flows from very basic, just to get you uh, um, familiar with the concepts. Uh, uh, we'll go through the RPA challenge, which is a little bit more complex, and then we'll go through a video of a, of a much complex uh, Power Automate desktop flow that interacts with cloud flows, AI builder, and uh, all the way through to a very legacy mainframe system. And lastly, we'll touch about uh, we'll touch on administration and governance and security because it's a very important topic, especially if you're interested um, and serious about implementing RPA or Power Automate desktop into your organization and scaling it. So firstly, what is RPA? Well, RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation, and no, there's no actual physical robot, unfortunately. RPA is a technology that allows you to build software robots in, the, in that it can help you then mimic the way a traditional person would interact with their computer. So clicking on a mouse, typing through the keyboard, reading, extracting information from a, a web page or screen. And because of this capability, RPA is very often used as an automation tool to automate away manual repetitive processes, um, you know, processes which are often rules based. So the way I like to think about it is if you can document that process, right, and give it to someone who's completely new to that process, they should be able to follow the steps and get to the same outcome. You know, if it requires on um, experience, luck, things like that, then chances are it's probably not a good candidate for um, automation. And yes, you can now infuse things like AI, machine learning model, decisioning systems, things like that. But for the most part, a lot of the RPA is still quite rules-based. And RPA as a technology has been around for over a decade, as I mentioned, um, but it hasn't really gained momentum, um, especially since um, probably over the past five, six years um, when it got featured on the Gartner Hype Curve. So um, RPA is actually so popular now um, that Gartner predicts that by 2022, which is the end of this year, it's uh, going to predict that spending, organization spending, is going to exceed $3 billion. So it's, uh, it's quite significant. So, so why is that? Why should you learn RPA and Power Automate Desktop? Well, firstly, digital transformation. In the last three to four years, especially during the pandemic, we hear a lot about how organizations had to accelerate the digital transformation, right? And they had to do this within a matter of weeks and months as opposed to you know, the years that it would have taken um, to, to, to achieve. And more often than not, during these transformations, they have processes that span across many different systems and applications. And a lot of them would be 
you know, like legacy type of applications where there's no APIs available. And because it is RPA is really suited to um, to help with with connecting these systems and applications together, as opposed to the traditional API led approach, because you know RPA can interact with these systems just like a person would through the keyboard, through their mouse, rather than through that API layer, which they may not exist or may not have access to. In addition, RPA is a technology. It doesn't need to eat, sleep, and drink. And as such, it's suited to run repeatedly throughout the day with little or no um, maintenance or downtime. It's also software, which means that calculations, um, the way it works is quite far, significantly faster than any person. And it also can uh, reduce the error rate because people or humans by nature is not really designed to interact or, or to do and perform uh, manual report, uh, repetitive boring tasks for a prolonged period of time. You know, we get tired, we get bored, we make mistakes. So, you know, the human in this equation um, doesn't go away, right? Because if anything, the last few years have taught us that RPA is now an enabler for many organizations. But we're in the midst of a global labor and skill shortage where it's harder and harder to find people and retain people. So rather than burden uh, employees with these manual repetitive boring tasks, RPA can now actually uh, create an efficiency gain, free up these employees and allow them to be refocused on higher value and more interesting work within an organization. So how does RPA fit in with the Power Platform then? Well, the Power Platform, or more specifically Power Automate, allows you or makers to create RPA processes or bots called desktop flows. So if you're if you're familiar with Power Automate before, whether you've built a Power App and you're trying to connect with SharePoint or Dataverse, or you've just created a flow that connects systems together, you know, chances are you probably um, uh, will be familiar with Cloud Flows. So what's the difference between the two? Well, Cloud Flows are more akin to the API integration I talked about earlier, right? You integrate with systems and applications through APIs, but it's abstracted away through the out-of-the-box connectors or through custom connectors you create yourself. Desktop flows is that UI automation. You know, it mimics and interacts with systems and applications through clicking, through keyboards, um, typing, and also through reading or screen scraping of, of an application. So I guess you know, when it comes to the Power Platform, it's really a holistic automation platform that allows you to provide both types of automation and integrations. And it's, uh, it's very powerful when, uh, when, when we think about it. If we dive into the desktop flow category a little bit more and get into specifics, there are also two types of desktop flows that you can create. Now, structurally, um, they're quite similar. The differences are really subtle. The main difference here is that with attended desktop flows, you require um, on the machine that it's going to run on to be logged in with the account that's associated with the connection account. Um, whereas with unattended, it doesn't need to be logged in. So when you run an unattended desktop flow, Power Automate will automatically log onto a machine, run it, and log back out. Okay. So I guess depending on this, there might be different scenarios which might be suited more for attended and some scenarios which are more suited for unattended. Because with unattended, you can't really you may not be able to run it on the person's laptop because they'll need to sign in. It has to be unlocked. So it's more suited to things like server um, type scenarios where you might run scheduled jobs throughout the day and throughout the night. With attended, it might be something which is triggered annually by a person on their laptop. They might have Excel open. You might want to extract that information from the Excel spreadsheet and upload that into a, a web application or a website. So in terms of licensing, Power, if you've dealt with licensing before in the Power Platform, it's quite interesting. And uh, luckily with Power Automate Desktop, it's a lot easier to understand. Licensing falls under two categories, plans and pay as you go. With plans, if you want to run attended automation, you need to purchase a Power Automate per, per user plan with attended RPA. And the reason for this is with desktop flows, it does need Dataverse. So that's why you need a plan, but it will allow you to run um, as much desktop flows as you want against that account on a machine. 
if you want to run unattended flow, you need a plan plus an additional add-on for unattended um, RPA. Pay as you go is more like that consumption model where you know you get charged per run of your flow and it will charge it against an Azure subscription. So there are different charge rates, I guess, depending on if it's attended or unattended. Um, and again, this is a good option if you have irregular run patterns, if you don't run your flows enough to justify a, a per user plan, or you really want to just get started and um, you, you want to you know, proof up a, a proof of concept, for example. So before we dive into the demos, I just want to talk a little bit about the components that make up the desktop flow ecosystem, right? Because it's, it's important to understand the components. So we've got two high level reference architectures here from Microsoft, okay? And um, if we look at the top um, architecture on the right hand side, we've got the Power Automate Cloud Services. So this is really the Power Automate Cloud Portal, the where you create your cloud flows and where you can uh, receive execution jobs to your actual machines that's gonna run your desktop flows. On the left-hand side is your machine. It could be a server, it could be a laptop, but basically there's a service that runs that takes these execution jobs from the cloud and it knows that, okay, it needs to run your desktop flow and send the results back. Now, traditionally, um, probably about a couple months ago, uh, you would have connected the cloud portion of Power Automate to your desktop could be on-premise, it could be in another cloud via an on-premise data gateway. And you're probably familiar with on-premise data gateways before if you've worked with cloud flows and you needed to access on-premise um, resources um, and uh, it's an additional piece of uh, configuration um, that you need to you set up. However, on-premise data gateway for desktop flows is being deprecated so it is um, recommended you uh, use the other option, which is machine runtime or di direct connectivity. And with direct, direct connectivity, you will actually bypass that on-premise data gateway. The cloud portal will connect directly with your machine runtime. Um, so again, the benefits of that is you save on um, having to set up on-premise data gateways, maintain them, update them, and you also provide uh, get provided with a much richer analytics experience, which we'll see a little bit later. So that's pretty much it for the slides, um, and we'll go into the demos. So what I want to do here is firstly go through the installation process, and then we'll go through a few examples of desktop flows just to get you up to speed. So. You can find the installation uh, or the installer of Power Automate Desktop from the uh, official uh, Microsoft site, or you can just Google Power Automate Desktop. And once you've installed, uh, or once you've downloaded the installer, you can double click on it and run it just like any executable. Um, here, I've already got Power Automate Desktop installed, but I will run through the installer just to, to walk you through what, what's the process. So as you step through the installation, just like any installer, you can specify you know, which directory you want to install it to. It will install a number of applications and features. By default, they're all enabled, and you can untick um, each feature or app that you don't want to install. The first application that it installs is Power Automate for Desktop, which is the designer. It allows you to edit, create, um, and debug your desktop flows. Now, if you're going to deploy this on a machine which you don't, like maybe a production machine, which you're not going to be editing anything, you don't need to install the installer. The runtime app is um, the agent that will connect directly with the cloud portal to um, you know, receive those execution jobs I talked about earlier. Um, there's a third option here, uh, which is the web driver and Chrome driver. They're more for advanced power automate type scenarios, uh, more niche scenarios where you want to run Selenium scripts. So we're not going to be covering those, but again, um, they're a little bit different to traditional, I guess, desktop flows. You've obviously got the, you know, the mandatory data collection, op op optional data collection and the T's and C's which you need to agree to. So we're just going to run the installer and it's actually a, a fairly quick installation. So once you finish the installation process, 
it will ask you to or prompt you to install um, a number of browser extensions, as we'll see. And whilst we're waiting for that to finish, here we go. Browser extensions are extensions or plugins you install at the browser level that allows you to automate against the browser. So you might want to have a desktop flow that opens a browser, could be Edge, could be Chrome, you know, type in some text boxes on a web page, click on some buttons on a web page, read the screen on a web page. So in order to do that, you do need to install these extensions. There are three types of extensions or, or browsers that are supported, Chrome, Edge, and Firefox. You can't install Firefox from here. Um, you, I'll show you where to do it a little bit later. Um, if you do forget to do it from the screen, you can also go back um, in your designer to actually do that as well. So um, if you click on the Chrome extension, you can see I've already installed it. But if you haven't installed it before, you have a button here to install it. It's just like any plugin um, for, uh, for, for, for any other browsers that you've probably installed plugins for. So um, once you've done that, we can close the installer. If we go to start and look for Power Automate, you can see there are two apps available now. The desktop app, which is the designer, which we'll go through shortly as well as the runtime, uh, machine runtime. So machine runtime is the agent. I've actually pre-configured this because um, you know, uh, if I don't trust my ability in live demos sometimes, um, but as you can see, once it runs, um, it's already logged in. It would have identified the local machine, which is this laptop, as the machine that it's going to run my desktop flows. It's also going to um, have all the uh, environment um, or the, the Power Platform environment already configured. Um, so this is the environment within Power Platform where the Dataverse environment is created. It's going to store all my desktop flows and my artifacts and things like that. So the other app is the designer. Okay. So when you open up the designer, you can change or specify which environment um, you want to select um, and create your desktop flows in. This ideally should be um, the same as the one you selected in the runtime. If you've got any existing flows, you can see them here. If you've got any flows which are shared with you, you'll see them in the shared with me section. And there's also in the examples uh, tab, uh, example RPA processes or desktop flows that you can also check out and download and play around with as well. So to create a flow is extremely easy. You just have to click on new flow at the top and you need to give your flow a name. And uh, we'll give a name of simple demo. You can see it's created the flow and it's gonna open up the canvas, which is the main area where you actually um, build your desktop flows. Now, before we get into it, I wanna show you one quick thing. If at the top, if you go to tools and browser extensions, these are the browser extensions we saw earlier. So if you did forget to install them, you can store them from here and you can see you also have the Firefox option from here as well. So I'm gonna create a really basic um, process, a desktop flow first. Um, and again, the idea is to really just show you the key concepts you'll probably need to understand before we look at a, a bit more of a complex example. So on the left-hand side, we have our action pane. The action pane consists of action groups. And action groups are groups of actions. So actions are the building blocks of your desktop flow. So again, if you're familiar with cloud flows, very similar concept. They allow you to define the behavior of your desktop flow, and they also allow you to, um, you know, for your desktop flow to interact with, uh, with different systems and applications. You can see there's a search box at the top, and it's very useful because there's a lot of actions and action groups, and these are constantly being updated and added by Microsoft. So if I want to work with a SQL database, for example, I can just type SQL at the top, and you can see I've got actions relating to SQL databases. I can open up a connection to a SQL database, I can run a query, and I can close the connection once I'm done. If I look and search for Excel, you can see um, I can there's a number of Excel actions, you know, from opening an Excel spreadsheet, adding a column, you know, creating worksheets, um, and closing um, the Excel spreadsheet. And we'll use some of these in, in the next demo. So to use an action is quite simple. We select the action that we want to use, and we just drag it to the middle section that we call a workspace. 
And a workspace is basically where you can structure your desktop flows, the actions, you know, in the order that you want to run them in. So once we drag an action into the workspace, you can see I get a configuration wizard. And in this wizard, um, I need to specify um, a number of different pieces of information. Firstly, parameters, um, variables, and also error handling. We'll go through each of the three. Parameters are inputs you provide to your action that will affect the way it behaves. So this action will open up a Windows application. So it makes sense that I would need to tell the desktop flow what application I want to open. So in this case, if I do notepad.exe and, um, and save, I just wanted to show you before I run it another type of action, which is execute a SQL statement against the database. You can see the parameters, this action is going to be different. Here, I need to pass in the connection string to tell it which database server, which database, and also what user credentials I need to connect with, as well as the statement, what query I'm executing. So they're going to be quite different. But as soon as you've put in some input parameters or the ones which are mandatory, you've really pretty much built your first desktop flow. You know, it's not a very useful flow if we run it. This flow will basically just open up my other screen, notepad, okay? But this is, in essence, how you would start piecing together your flow. If we go back into the wizard, okay, we've got the um, application path. There are, I guess, some generic um, parameters which will apply to most actions. So, for example, window style, do you want to, you know, open the application, maximize, minimize, hidden, Etc. And also, how do you want to configure the behavior of the flow? Does it continue running immediately? Do you need to wait um, if for the application to load? Things like that. But once you specified your parameters, you then need to um, have a look at the variables. So variables are basically dynamic values that you can then use throughout the rest of your flow. Now, most actions allow you to create a variable, and a variable would the data type of the variable would depend on what the action is. So there are very there are a lot of different data types that um, you can create. Um, so for example, the most basic ones are text, number, uh, lists. There's also other ones like data tables, rows, and we'll get to those in the next example um, once we get into something a little bit more complex. So as you can see here, when I use the run application action, it will produce a variable that will store the process ID, okay? Um, if you don't want to store or create this variable, you can actually just disable it, but by default, it will be enabled. You can also click on the variable name and give it a different name. That's That, that can be done from here. So if we save this and I run this again, you can see on the right-hand side in the variable pane, this is the variable that was automatically created when I um, um, added this action in, and it's got a value of 11,352. So if I go to my task manager over here and I look at details and I go to notepad, that's this one here, 11,352. So this variable pane, is a good way for you to see what variables are used in your flow. And as you run the flow, it's a very good debugging tool because you can see the flow of data within your desktop flow as you run, and it helps you if you're debugging. So how do you use a variable? Well, if I go and add a pop-up or a message box into my desktop flow, I'm just going to go info. To use a variable, you can either click on the select variable icon on the top right-hand side. And you can see again, similar to the variable pane on the right-hand side, you've got that in here. You can search for it, or you can just double click on it and select it. So when you use a variable, basically you add a percentage sign before and after the variable name. And that's the syntax Power Automate will use to distinguish that it is a variable versus some static text. So if I click on save and click on run again, it's now going to open up Notepad and it's going to display the process ID in a pop-up. 
Now, if we go to the right-hand side again, you'll notice when I added the display message pop-up action, it's created another variable, okay? So let's have a quick look at this. If we go to the message box options and go to yes, no, and cancel, and let's run this again. You can now see I've got a message box with three options. If I click on no, you can see again, I can store the value of the button click, the user input into that variable. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great mechanism that to allow you to get some input from a user and to, you know, distinguish or add some logic into your flow depending on the user input. And again, you know, there's a lot of different data types. I encourage you to check out the Microsoft Docs and, 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 and check them out. So the last thing that I want to talk about is error handling. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the name of my application to something that obviously it's not going to exist. And I'm going to save this and I'm going to run it. Now it's going to cause an error or an exception, as you can see here. And that's the default behavior of desktop flows. With desktop flows, if it encounters an error, it will stop running at that point in time. You need to fix that error. However, you can override it because there are some scenarios when you do want to override it. So to do that, you come back into the wizard and you click on, on error. And then that will basically allow you to specify some error handling behavior. You can retry the action again, um, either the number of times or at a specific interval. You can say, okay, I don't really want to stop the flow. I just want to continue running onto the next action. And you can also add some rules. So if you go to new rules, you can specify to set a variable. So you might want to log an error message. You might want to set a flag within your desktop flow. And you can also run something called a subflow. So subflows are, are, are something we're going to cover today, but they basically allow your desktop flows to call out a desktop flows in sort of like a parent-child relationship. And this is useful because sometimes you, you end up with one really big long flow. And rather than have one big long desktop flow, you can set, partition them into smaller flows. And that just makes it easier to maintain, that makes it easier to debug, and also promote reusability. So if you need to, for example, log, a, log an error into maybe a log file, into a database, rather than have you know, that logic or those set of actions that does the logging embedded across your flow multiple times, you can just create one subflow and then call that same subflow in any action that you need to log errors. And if anything changes, whether the, it's the file path of your log file, the database connection, you just have to change the subflow. So if we go and um, enable the continue flow run um, option and run this now, it's going to, again, still have an error, but you can see it's continued processing to the next step. Okay. And obviously the ID is going to be zero because there's no application that was open. So let's look at a more complex example. So what we're going to do here is delete everything. And the example that I want to now go through is the RPA challenge. Just opening up the window. So the RPA challenge is, uh, I guess, a well-known challenge that many RPA developers um, use to, you know, try to test out RPA capabilities of different platforms. And the idea here is to take this Excel spreadsheet, which is downloaded from this link here, and this spreadsheet contains some information about different um, people within an organization, and you need to build some sort of RPA process, which will then populate these fields in a manner which is as accurate as possible and also as quickly as possible. So we'll do that as accurately as possible. We won't focus on the as quickly as possible part because you know sometimes it's not the best way to show you how everything works. So what we'll then do is, um, what we'll do is um, I'll show you the way which actually allows me to show you as much of Power Automate Desktop as possible. So the first thing we'll do is we'll create some actions or we'll use some actions that will allow us to take that Excel spreadsheet 
and get the data from that spreadsheet. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look for a launch Excel option. And the launch Excel option allows me to open up a spreadsheet. Um, I'm going to select a document. I'm going to browse to the document that is on my desktop. And there's a number of other uh, standard for, um, options parameters here. You know, you might want to set it to read only so you don't accidentally um, uh, edit the file. So we want to get the data, um, the details uh, within this particular region, right? And in order to do that, we need to get the index of the of the last column, as well as you know which row has is the last row with data. So in Power Automate Desktop, we actually have an action, which is get first free column or row. So we'll wait for this to save, and then we'll look for get free. get first rather, and we can drag that here. And you can see there's an Excel instance variable, and that is basically the output variable um, from that first action launch Excel. So it will know that it needs to access this Excel that was opened and whatever worksheet or workbook that was opened. This action itself produces two variables, first free column and first free row. So if we save that, and run it, you can see it's going to open up Excel. And on the right-hand side, we should see some values, 8 and 12. So the first the first three column is 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's right. And the first three rows, obviously, 12. So what we need to do is we need to subtract an index of 1 to get the last actual column in the row. So what we're then going to use is get uh, read from Excel. And if we drag that in here, again, we've got the instance, but we have some additional parameters. So we can actually get a single cell of data. We can get a range of cells and we need to provide the start and ending um, columns uh, in rows. So we're gonna select the first column. We're gonna select the first row. And for the end column, we're going to select first three column minus one and end row is going to be first free row minus one. So we're going to save that. And now if we run this, we should be able to get the data from our spreadsheet. So it looks pretty good. The only thing is, as you can see, it's actually included the header. So what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, scroll down a little bit and go to advance. And you can see there's a parameter here which we can enable to let it know to ignore the first row. So as you're using these actions, it's very important to you know maybe check out these parameters and because um, some of them are, are quite useful. So what we're going to do is we're then going to loop through each of the data uh, or each of the rows that's returned from that um, from that data table. So we're going to select the Excel data, and you can see the data type of Excel data is data table, and it's going to output the current item. So again, if I go to message box and do an output, I can go current item is. I can select current item, and this will give me the entire row. So how do I actually get you know, the first column of the first row, of that relevant row? So I can either use the square brackets and pass in the index, but that's not really useful because it makes it really hard if I need to debug it um, or come back to it in a couple of days later. I don't know what column zero, column one, column two is gonna mean. So I, what I can also do is I can actually pass in the column name. So if I run this again now, it should now give me the first name of each of the employees within that organization. John, Jane, etc. So next, what I'm going to do is I need to be able to pass that information to the RPA Challenge webpage. 
So in order to do that, I'm going to look for web. And you can see here, there's a number of different actions for interacting with web pages. I'm going to use the populate text field option. And this will allow me to uh, populate that text field. But you can see there's no browser instance. And there's no browser instance because I actually, um, well, the desktop flow doesn't know which browser to use. So I also then need to launch a browser first. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the launch new Chrome option uh, action, and I'm going to paste in the URL. If I come back to it again, you can see it's going to find this browser variable. I need to specify what's the text field um, or which text field I want to use. So you can see there's nothing here. I can click on add UI element. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to find the first name. You can see as I hover over each of the text boxes, it's going to allow me to um, search um, and select. So Power Automate Desktop, the recorder, will automatically um, identify HTML, HTML elements. Okay? So to select it, you click on Control and click on it. And what's that going to do is if I go back to my designer, it's going to create a UI element, which we'll come back to a little bit later. And next, I need to specify what text I want to include or type into that text box. So I'm going to type in first name because it's going to be the first name text box. So if I go to advanced, there's also a number of different param parameters you can specify. Uh, I'm going to untick this populate text using physical keystroke. Um, you know, sometimes you do need to sort of play around with some of this um, as well. So if you hit save um, and run, you would expect that it's going to run. However, um, it is called the RPA challenge for a reason. Um, and the reason is, yes, it's ran part of the flow. It's opened up the browser. But as you can see, it's given me the first name. But it's going to throw an error when it tries to populate this first name. And it's going to throw an error very shortly. And the reason is it's complaining that it can't find my first name field. And the reason for this is if I do a inspect on the first name field, you can see it's going to look for an ID parameter with this particular value. However, the ID parameter is a different value. And that's why they call it the RPA challenge, because if I refresh this, you can see not only does the UI change, you know, the positioning change, but the actual HTML in the back end also changes as well. So what we can do is on the right hand side, if you go to this um, little uh, stack of papers in the hamburger menu, you can see a different menu called UI elements. And this is the actual first name text box. So what I usually do is I usually rename this first because it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to remember what exactly that um, element is. And I'm going to call this first name text box. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this. And I'm going to change this to look for a different property. Now, this is going to de differ depending on um, you know, what your web page is. You might not need to do it for your web page because, you know, you might not have some sort of logic that does this in the back end. But if I go back to first name and I go to inspect, I can see very clearly um, after a few iterations of trial and error that I can use a different property, this ng reflect name, um, as the identifier or the anchor because it's not going to change. So if I close this, save this, run this again, it should now allow me to actually, or allow the recorder rather, to open up the browser to find the first name and populate the first name. So we'll give it a few, a, a little bit. Just going to loop through the name. And you can see it's now found the text field. It's going to keep populating um, each of the names in that data table. So I obviously need to go and do that for each of the other fields in the example. So rather than sort of sit there and, um, and do that, I've already created um, a desktop flow, which is exactly the same. 
as the one we saw earlier, but with everything pre-filled. So as we run this, it should do the same thing, but um, it should complete the process end-to-end. -end. So you can see I've done it for first name, last name, company name for each of the fields. So we're going to run this again. And it's going to open up the browser. And it's going to populate each of the fields successfully. Now, again, it's going to do it very accurately. And there are things you can do to tweak it to make it significantly faster. But again, you know, that's not really what we're trying to uh, achieve today. So you can see it's done the first one, it's going to do the second one, and so forth. Cool. So um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to talk about um, two more things. The first one is an into a demo of another desktop flow that we've built. Uh, I've built a while back. And this desktop flow, I guess, is to show you how you can create more complex scenarios outside of Excel, outside of you know, updating to a website. So this desktop flow starts off with a cloud flow. And this cloud flow will monitor an, an email address, uh, a mailbox. It will get invoices, which are, then, which are then downloaded and sent to AI Builder. So if you haven't played with AI Builder, it's a great way for you to you know, do intelligent document processing. We extract key value pairs, invoice number, purchase order number, details about the dollar figures with, from AI Builder. And then what we then do is we store that into a SQL database, and then we run the desktop flow or trigger the desktop flow directly from the cloud flow. So the two desktop flows um, are pictured here. The first desktop flow will take a CSV file. It would upload it to a, a web application to load the invoice data. And then the second desktop flow is, um, which we'll see shortly, uses terminal emulation. So it will try, it will process the invoice in, um, in an AS400 mainframe system. So again, you know, the, this is more of a, a niche type of scenario. If you've worked with AS400 mainframe systems before, they're quite um, manual and tedious. And again, with desktop flows and our, uh, a power automate desktop, you can automate that so that it can process very quickly and also very accurately. So the last thing I want to quickly touch on is administration and governance. So it's a very important topic. So the first thing I want to talk about is data loss prevention policies. And again, if you've worked with Cloudflows before, it's very much the same concept. You can create a policy at an environment level that allows you to prevent your makers from using certain connectors or using certain connectors in combination with other connectors. So if you do a search for desktop, you can see there are a number of desktop flow connectors now. And if you add that or exclude it to the policy, users or makers won't be able to use them. Do keep in mind it is a preview feature, so there are some limitations. Things will continue to change, okay? But it is worth checking out. The last thing I want to talk about is analytics. There are three places that you can access analytics of your desktop flows. The first is directly from your Power Platform Admin Center, okay? And the Power Platform Admin Center provides, I guess, high-level uh, analytics against your usage, your run data, what connectors you're using, and things like that. So very similar, again, to your Power App analytics and also your Cloudflow analytics, okay? The second source of data is from your actual Power Automate Cloud portal. So if you go to Monitor, you can see Cloudflow activity, but you can also see a preview for desktop flow activity as well. So if you go to here, you can see, um, we haven't run anything, but you, you'll see um, data um, from other desktop flows uh, of your desktop flows over the past few days. So if I go to desktop flow run, it may take a little bit of time. So maybe if I switch environments, we should see um, some data come through. So you can see this is what you expect to see as part of the desktop flow activities. And um, you can see again the run data, what the error rate is, um, trends, and you can also see each run, whether they failed or succeeded or not. And the last thing I want to quickly talk about, hopefully we still have time, is the automation kit.
And your automation kit is a series of tools that you can store as a standalone product in your Power Platform environment. And it provides you with tools such as backlog management. You know, if you've got a lot of opportunities, you can manage them a lot easier um, within your organization. And as you act, add in these opportunities into your backlog management, you'll enter in KPIs and ROI as well. And based on this ROI, you can then use the prioritization tools. You know, it will allow you to see and visualize what the benefits are so you can then, you know, uh, talk that up with your um, sponsors of your automation programs or your, um, or your management. There's also RPA dash dashboards. Um, these are real time. Okay, so as you run your desktop flows, each run is metered and will automatically write back to Dataverse. And, um, and again, you'll see the ROI reflected in real time. And again, it's very useful to, to justify the benefits of your automation pipeline or portfolio. And also there's operational dashboards as well. So operational dashboards allow you to visualize your entire environment, how many machines are currently running processes or, or desktop flows, what's the error rate, um, you know, what's the peak periods um, of, uh, of operation, Maybe it allows you to identify bottlenecks. Do you need to start adding in some additional servers? Do you need to um, maybe schedule and run things a little bit differently? So that's really it for me today. Um, I hope you found the session both informative and interesting. And i um, not sure how we're tracking for time or if there's any time for questions, but yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, so we're a bit tight on time, but there are a few questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, let, let, let's give it a couple of minutes and, and, uh, and late a bit. Right. So one question is about Matt. I had an attempt to, to answer because I know I used it in one case with the mainframe, but uh, Matt's interested to know uh, actual usage of uh, desktop flows. But he mentioned that it helped us to migrate some data, but I'm not sure how else it Yep. Um, yeah, so so I guess with desktop flows, the idea is for you to be able to, um, you know, connect systems together, but rather through APIs, it's through, you know, UI automation or through the user interface. So any scenarios which, you know, you need to perform, whether it's orchestration of processes, whether it's um, moving data from A to B, or whether it's, um, you know, maybe, um, uh, actually performing some sort of work that someone would have done traditionally, you know, that can be automated through desktop flows. Um, so the idea is if I had to, you know, every morning um, as part of my operational task, I had to, you know, monitor my inbox. I used to download a whole bunch of invoices, type it into a spreadsheet, upload it, and then type it into another system. The purpose of desktop flows is to do all that in an automated fashion. And sometimes cloud flows or APIs won't be able to do all of that for you. So um, yeah, it really depends on your scenario and it's quite flexible. And again, desktop flow is a part of the toolkit, right? It's when we now hear about hyper automation, it's one of the toolkits that will allow you to automate your processes. You know, other tools like digital process or workflows, low code, AI, you know, they all part, form part of the other tools within hyper automation. There's a couple more questions, but we got to run on the next session. Uh, yeah. Maybe, yeah, Eric and myself, we might answer those uh, later, but yeah. yeah, feel free to connect with Eric and myself and uh, yeah, happy to. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Eric. Really interesting okay. stuff.